with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 9. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 9. Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pray then like this. Our Lord does not say pray this as though what he wanted from us was a mere repetition of this formula that he has laid down so many times a day and facing in such a direction. And No, there is no power in formulations and empty words. What he gives us here is not something to be repeated without thought, but rather a framework to give direction to our own words. And so we must examine them very carefully, not just to hear the words themselves, but to understand what they are telling us about reality and how that reality empowers and informs our prayers. If you are a Christian today and you desire a richer prayer life, if you feel a lack of power in your prayers, if you feel a lack of connectivity when you pray, if your prayer life is not in some way what you feel and believe that it ought to be, if your feelings and your beliefs are informed by Scripture, then what you require is in the Lord's Prayer. What you require is not a certain shape to play around your prayers or a new formula by which to pray. But you require a greater knowledge of who you pray to and a greater knowledge of who you are in prayer and some direction from these. If you are here today and you are not a Christian, And these words are not for you. The Bible is clear. And while God hears the prayers of the righteous, the prayers of the unrighteous, he does not hear. You can pray all you want to, but until you submit to Christ and receive him as Lord and as Savior, you have no audience before God. You have no way of approaching him. And all you do when you pray is make noises. If you're here and you are not in Christ, repent today. Yes. Now let us pray. Our Father, I thank you for this prayer that we are about to delve into. I thank you for the way that it informs our whole life of prayer. I thank you for the wonderful truths of the gospel that are displayed herein. Father, it is far beyond me to exposit these things. My strength fails me even now. So direct my words. Lord, let them be indeed your words. Let your voice be heard. All of these. They might pray the way that you want them to. And that those who cannot pray might find that ability in Christ to do so. It's those who are not your children, you would have as adopted sons and daughters would come to you even this day. That those who are your children would recognize that they really are. Lord, above all, have your way. Your will be done, and to you be all glory and honor and dominion forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pray then like this, our Father. Our Father. Not my Father. Not your Father. Our Father. There is in this very first word a profound truth that is so easy to overlook. 
when we pray, we are not alone. We are not isolated individuals. And no such people exist within the kingdom. And does that mean that you don't have a one-on-one -on -one audience to God and he is not fully inclined to what you are saying? Certainly not. What it means is that you're not the only one who are saying those things. At least you shouldn't be. When you pray, you are standing before the throne of your Father. You are standing there as one of many brothers and sisters and a great and august host that is the family of God. In our Western understanding, we have become such rugged individualists that we often overlook the collective nature of real Christianity. Just to say that we simply forget that we're not alone in all of this. I think this reality is particularly pressing in this congregation today because we are an independent church, and that is a dangerous, dangerous thing to be. Not that there's anything wrong with being independent and having no denominational affiliations, but we can misunderstand that word to mean something that is not intended to mean, is made clear in our Constitution, and something that it cannot mean because the opposite is made clear in Scripture. Just as no Christian stands alone, so no congregation stands alone, but whether uh, we have brothers and sisters in a Southern Baptist church church or a primitive Baptist church or a free will Baptist church or a Cumberland Presbyterian church or a Reformed Presbyterian church or a Missouri Synod Lutheran church or the United Methodist church or the Anglican church or whatever sort of church that believers might be found on, they are all part of one church and we are united with them in a bond more serious and deeper than any denominational associational affiliation which is the very blood of Christ. And so we ought to pray like it. We are not to come before our Father only by ourselves and thinking only of ourselves, but all throughout this prayer, the term will occur, our. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our concern is not merely for ourselves, for we are part of something greater. Our concern is for the whole of the kingdom. It ought to be for the whole of the church, for all of our brothers and sisters, as their concern ought to be for us. And the church needs to represent this truth in our prayers, just as we need to represent it in all the things that we do. For in this, in this, we give proof of one of the great realities of the gospel. For one of the great longings of the human heart has been and always shall be until Christ comes again to establish the kingdom in full to be part of something bigger and greater than ourselves. Everyone is looking for a community. Whether they know it or not. And this world has so little community to offer. It was not always so at least not to this degree. There used to be a greater sense of national identity. There used to be such a thing as reaching hands across the political aisle for the greater good. There used to be such a concept as the greater good. But even this is breaking down. And where will people flee? And where will they find rest from all of these divisions? And where will they find the promised community that their deepest, inmost heart desire yearns for with an insatiable yearning? Where else shall they find it but in the church? And I fear that in the church they do not find it, for the church has lost its identity. We have amnesia. We come before God and say, my Father, instead of our Father, Mia Cooper.
my fault. I am guilty. We need to change our rhetoric and prayer. Well, why? God knows what we mean. He knows what we need before we need it. That was in the last verse. When we go on to Paul, he'll say that the Spirit within us prays. Jesus tells us the same thing in his closing dialogues from chapter 14 all the way into chapter 16 and even 17 of the Gospel of John. So why bother with the rhetoric? And this question is important to answer before we go any further. The rhetoric of prayer matters in several ways. First, it matters that we pray rightly because the Lord desires for us to be right. At the end of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, you will, you will find this great and terrible formulation, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. You must be holy as your Father is holy. We have to be right. And so it is written, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst to be right. They will be satisfied. In Matthew 6.33, in a few verses, our Lord will say that we ought to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. If we want to be right, not simply because it is right, but because it is also good. As Nancy Piercy has said, it is not enough simply to think that Christianity is right if you're going to be a professing Christian. You must also go on to say that not only is it right, but it's also best. That is to say, if we follow the realities as laid out in scriptures and we direct our path according to the commandments and the clear teachings of the Bible, things will go better for us. If you are here today and you do not believe that, you have a serious problem. What do we do about those serious problems? We have to address them. And so in being right in our prayer, we actually direct ourselves to be more right in our hearts. That is, by aligning our prayers to the realities manifested in Scripture, we begin to manifest those realities within our heart itself. Prayer changes your heart. Oftentimes we pray looking only to change our circumstances to change the window dressings, as it were, as though it were enough to fix the broken window pane that is our life simply by hanging new drapery over it. It's absurd. It's moronic. It's wasteful. It's wanton. It's just silly. The greater reality of prayer is that not only can it change outward circumstances, but it can change inner circumstances. It can change the heart. And so when we pray, according to the model that our Lord gives us, we become more like our Lord. We become more righteous than we were to begin with. So we need to watch our rhetoric in prayer. For we want to be right, for a righteous prayer is the sort of prayer that God will hear, the sort that honors Him, the sort that delights Him, the sort that He loves. But it is also the sort that will move our heart to be closer to the heart of God, nearer our God to thee. And that will be good for us. I cannot exposit how good it will be. I cannot explain to you what sort of rest comes out of the realignment of reality to the true reality of Scripture. I can tell you that it is profound and that you will be surprised what even the substitution of the two letters that are my for the three letters that are R will begin to make in your life. It will satisfy your longing for community because you have that community and if you think that you do not and you are in Christ and the problem is that you do not have it is that you do not recognize it 
You are like the child who having the desire of his heart right before him in a package fails to have it only because he has not opened the package yet. That we are together and that our prayers overlap with one another and that we support each other all across the world in this way. That we are never as alone as we might think we are is made true by the next word that we all have God for our Father. There are some who would say that we have God for our Father in the most general sense. And as many scholars will point out, including D.A. Carson and Albert Moeller, that is true. That is true, for we are all the descendants of Adam. And so we all have God for our original creator, and we are all brothers sharing in that same race of Adam. Or indeed, as Vadi Bakum has pointed out, race does not exist. It is a socially constructed idea. And why it was socially constructed is beyond me. But I will tell you that all that it has done is reap evil upon the world. The Bible does not know of race. It is true to say that we are all brothers, all being of the race of Adam. It is true to say that we have God as our ultimate creator and not in a general sense he is father. But what our Lord has in mind here is not that general sense. For that general sense lost all of its power in the rebellion of Adam and Eve in the garden, which you can read about in Genesis chapter 3. In that moment, the relationship was broken. It was broken to an extent that human minds could not begin to fathom repairing. All of our attempts, and you can read about them, all of them have fallen short. When we tried to build a tower up to heaven, it did not work. It could not work. Though the Israelites poured out rivers and oceans of blood all throughout the Old Testament, it could not begin to atone for their sins. And so those who can call upon the Lord as our Father are only those who come to him through the Son. The Son who is uniquely positioned to pray to my Father. For he was the only begotten one, the second person of the Trinity. He was fully God. So that John writes in the first verse, the first chapter, that in the beginning was the Word, which is Christ. And that Word was with God. Not only was he with God, but he was God. Yes. He came and he lived a perfect life as a man humbling himself. Humbling himself even to the point of death on a cross. The unthinkable, the infinite, in a moment of finitude. He who was from eternity past, knowing an end. The one who was life itself, tasting of death. But the grave could not hold him, and sin could not bury him. But up from the grave he arose in a victory, a victory in which and through which we are now the adopted sons and daughters when we come to him he makes us part of the family Amen. that is the only way that you can utter these words there is no other way there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved but that of Christ and Christ alone And the wonder of it is not that there is only one way, but the wonder of it is that there is even one way. We lose that wonder just as we lose the wonder of being able to say our Father because we have so focused on the intimacy of God. We have so built up our theology of the fatherhood of God. And we have made him so close to us that we fail to remember who it is that is drawn near. We have lost the power of Emmanuel. 
because we read our Father and then we skip over in heaven. As though that were merely a description of his locale. As though he were checking in on Facebook. Where is God the Father? Oh, he's in heaven. He just checked in. Those who heard these words the first time on the side of that hill, they would have been astonished. They would have been flabbergasted. They might have even been outraged when Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father. They would have been mind blown. What do you mean? We're calling God the Father. No, no, no. Jesus, look, when we pray to God, we are praying to the great God of all the universe. We are praying to the Almighty One. We are praying to the Lawgiver. We are praying to the God of heaven and earth. We are praying to the God of God, the kings of kings, the one true and living God. He is high and lifted up. He is exalted beyond all the ideas of man. His dwelling place is so high above us, we could not deign to look up and glance it. What do you mean? We can call him Father. Now Jesus, being infinitely wise and foreknowing all the struggles that he would face, he sees that this pendulum would swing from one direction to the other. And so he guards our hearts, even as he guards the hearts of the Israelites from thinking that God is too far away, from the first believers are thinking that God is so inaccessible that he is not really near to us and that he does not have an intimate relationship with us of perfect love for us in Jesus the Son, even as he sees that we will think that we are a little too close and we will read the word Abba and think it means Daddy. It does not. He foresees this, so he tells us who is in heaven. Pray to our Father who is in heaven. That is, he is still exalted. He is still high and lifted up. He is not your Daddy. He is not the Man upstairs, the old man. He is the God of all creation. He is the God who spoke and things simply were. He is the God whose word is forever settled in the heaven. He is the God who laughs at the folly resistance of the nations in Psalms 2. He is the God who lives, the God who speaks, the God who ordains light and darkness. The God who will not let his glory go to another. He is in heaven. We must remember that he is in heaven. I think one of the reasons that our prayers so often fall empty, one of the reasons that we do not receive the things that we are to receive from prayer, such as that peace that surpasses all understanding, is because we have no idea who we're talking to anymore. We have made him to be our God who is on the sofa across the room. And that God can't do anything for us. We have made him to be subservient to us, like our earthly daddy that we could have wrapped around our fingers, that we could manipulate, that we could exasperate, that we could cause to bend to our will. He is nothing like that. If you pray to a God who is so small, you have made him not intimate, but you have made him small. You have brought him not near, but you have shrunk him down. No wonder your prayers have no effect. No wonder you feel no peace. You're talking to some idol fashioned by your own hand and not to the Lord who is sovereign over all. But when we understand first that God is high and lifted up, when we understand that the first word in the Bible, which is in the beginning, God, establishes him as the primary mover, the one who is above all, the one for whom all things exist, the one who is at the center of the universe and who is the primary cause of everything and is perfectly in control of everything and understands everything and transcends everything. When we understand that God is transcendent, then and only then will his intimacy See, will the idea of Emmanuel, the God who is with us, only then will it make any sense and have any power. There is no wonder in a small God who is close to you. There is no benefit in that. 
but a God who transcends all limitations, a God who transcends our four dimensions, a God who exists in a way that we cannot begin to fathom. That is a God who is mighty to save. That is a God who can deliver us. That is a God who can give us rest. And when that God says to us, I have established a way, and I would call you my son and my daughter by adoption through the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit, there is a profound wonder in this that enlivens our existence and gives us purpose and community and value and Love, in which we find all that we need. Now our Lord has not yet made explicit enough how true those last few words are, but he will. Hear me good on this. If you do not understand the first phrase of the Lord's Prayer, if you do not understand our Father who is in heaven, then everything that follows that you will fail to understand. You must know God as he is, the greatest of all possible beings who transcends all limitations. And you must know that he desires to have a relationship with you where you can call him Abba, Father. And he desires it to the point that he is even delighted to crush his own son, his beloved son. So that you might be adopted. And that he has not paid such a price for you alone but he has ransomed for himself many sons and many daughters to build up a family and a kingdom of priests to his glory. And when you understand that concept, when you understand who God is, not only your prayers, but the rest of your life will begin to form itself into a right order your perception will begin to clear as the things of this world go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And you will know more and more as you continue to pray in that reality and to realize that reality, the life more abundant and free that Christ came to give us. If you are here and you do not know Christ today, you have nothing. Whatever you think you have, you don't have it and you will lose it. You cannot call God your father, but he calls you his enemy. You will not triumph in that battle, friend. You will not find a better father. You will not know a better friend than Jesus. And there is nothing better that you could serve than the one who served us all. Let me pray for you. Our Father, it is not within me to do justice to these words. Though I preached them the rest of my life and not else, and I studied them and read all the literature on them, and though I toiled in prayer over them, it would not be enough. Father, I feel very profoundly how much is lacking in my words. And my heart breaks for the people. Oh Lord, that you had sent them a better preacher this day. Father, by your Spirit, make the word known to them, that they may have all that you desire them to have. Lord, 
grant it to your glory in Jesus name amen whatever the Lord has laid on